Welcome to the evening's program, talking about consent with our youth. I'm Debbie Wiedinghoff, President of the National Council of Jewish Women, the Chicago North Shore section. Thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, please note that everyone is muted to minimize any feedback noise. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, JCAST, the Jewish Community Against Sex Trafficking, was founded in 2013, and it is a program of NCJW Chicago North Shore. JCAST was created to educate and engage those in Chicago and surrounding communities in sex trafficking prevention. JCAST is committed to ensuring that everyone can live a life free from coercion, violence, and exploitation. JCAST falls under the leadership of NCJW Director of Violence Against Women Initiatives, Sherry Petlin. Sherry can raise her hand. Sherry also oversees Luggage for Freedom, Traffic Teens, Silent Witness, and Court Watch. To learn more about any of these programs, as well as JCAST, please visit our website at ncjwcns.org. The pandemic has forced all of us to stay in our homes for longer periods of time than, we, than any of us ever imagined. However, it has also given us time and opportunity to talk with the young people in our lives. And our topic tonight, defining consent and building healthy relationships is such an important talk to have. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenters, Gail Nelson, Engagement and Development Director of JCAST and Kathy Carmody, NCJW Life Member and a JCAST Steering Committee Member. And now I turn the evening over to Kathy. Great, thanks. And thanks you all for coming. Uh, as we were chatting about before we started, one of the nice things about Zoom is that you don't have to cancel an event because of a snowstorm. So here we are. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. If you came in January, thanks for coming back. Uh, that's always good for us to see uh, familiar names, even though a lot of folks don't have their video on. I, when I uh, move into screen share, so you'll be able to see the presentation, won't really be able to see you. But Gail, if you wave, um, uh, Gail will be personing. She'll be uh, handling the chat function and please feel free to ask questions, make comments. We've got some quizzes uh, sort of for fun, uh, as well as uh, some uh, interaction ability so that you can uh, give some input. Eventually, you know, it depends on how many people are here, things like that. At some point, maybe towards the end also, we might be able to get off mute so that people can ask questions. Some people are more comfortable asking them verbally, but feel free to start with the chat so that we can uh, multitask. All right. So let's start with screen sharing. Here we go. So you should all be able to see our, our front page, welcoming you to healthy relationships and consent with our youth. If you can't, please um, let somebody know in the chat and we'll figure out how to go from there. And we will see, there we go. All right, so uh, as for those of you who were here last time, uh, we talked about the fact that from JCAST's point of view, we see sex trafficking as a form of slavery and that slavery, as you know, has existed in many forms over the millennia. Uh, we Jews were slaves in Egypt. In the US, we fought a civil war about slavery. And we consider sex trafficking also a form of, of modern day slavery uh, as an economic form of slavery. And we want to try and help end that as well. So this is the second of three virtual sessions. Last time we talked about facts and fictions. If you weren't able to attend, I believe, uh, I believe there might be a link on our uh, NCJW Chicago North Shore, uh, ncjwcns.org website, or you can find it on YouTube under sex trafficking and fact, 
uh, sex trafficking facts and fictions. And it's in the chat. Oh, you put it in the chat. Okay, so I, I don't see chat and I don't wanna look at it cause it'll, it'll confuse, <laughs> fuse my brain. So tonight we wanna talk about uh, discussing healthy relations and consent with our youth. And then in March, we'll talk about, we'll talk more about prostitution, which we talked about in the first session, uh, but we'll spend most of the time there talking about basically, is it work or is it prey? And I don't know if you can see the gray where the or is, but it's, uh, it's quite a controversial topic. Do we legalize prostitution? And that's what we'll talk about next time. Um, uh, Debbie introduced me. I'll tell you a little bit, a bit more about myself. I, I live in Morton Grove. I've uh, been in Chicago for, I don't know, uh, many decades. Grew up in St. Louis. I'm still a Cardinal fan. I don't know if you could see that. Um, but I've been in NCJW for probably 30 years or more. I spent most of my professional career in leadership development in coaching uh, and human resources. So I've spent a lot of time working with leaders on how do they communicate and how do they my philosophy kind of was that the higher they went in management, the more they forgot how to be human beings. And so we need, we in human resources needed to teach them how to be human beings. So uh, it's kind of natural for me in retirement then to keep spreading the word about how important powerful conversations are. Gail. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with all of you. I am Gail Nelson, the Engagement and Development Director at JCAST. Uh, I have, uh, my, my passion has always been about engaging uh, women and engaging everyone in this, in this advocacy and in making social change. And I have a passion for leadership development and for supporting um, people that have lived experience. And so I'm just excited to be here with all of you. Great, thanks. So we like to do a little Pre-questions, uh, you should have received that in your reminder note today. And um, the question, and you probably recognize this thing called the CDC, which is this, yes, that's the same CDC as you know with Dr. Fauci. But what they do is uh, as well, they do uh, lots of stuff on health and um, they have an enormous amount of information and data about youth and they do a report, this uh, 2019 report, I think might be the most recent one. And they do a whole sexual health report and survey every year or two. So from that survey, stick, find your chat. This is where you get to find your chat if you're not used to finding it and put in there, a number between zero and a hundred. What percent of high school students have ever had ever had sex when they took this survey in 2019? And that's all of high school. So pick a number and hit enter and let us see what we've got there. So that's 75, 45, 38, 50, some more 30s, another 50 and a 40, and a seven couple of 75s. Oh wow! You 50. Guys, We're all over the place. You That's guys, what? You guys must have had a better high school experience than I did. Holy cow! Okay, uh, the answer according to the CDC is thirty-eight percent. So, is that a lot? Is that a little? Um, that's something that you can experience now that you had that number. What's your reaction to that? And how do you use that reaction when when you're going to be responding? Uh, to your children and grandchildren about sex and, and relationships. And then another one is, uh, and this one is great for, it's the numbers because it's from 29, I think it's from 2019 or so, but it's definitely pre-pandemic. So the number will probably be higher now, but what percent of youth are redirected to pornography when they're doing their homework? You know, they type in the wrong, they misspell something and it goes to porn. Stick a number between zero and a hundred in there. What do you what are you what are you adding? What do you see, Gail? 45, 22, 60, 25, 30. Again, we're all over the place. Yeah. And this number five. Does this number freak you all out? 70% of them have at least once been redirected to porn 
when they're doing their homework. And so you can imagine it's probably even higher now. But remember, it happens to adults as well. You know, <laughs> there's a story of um, somebody trying to find information about uh, bidet manufacturers when they're redoing their bathroom. And the URL, the address name for the bidet company was hellotushy.com. But they typed in tushy.com. Guess where they went? So the, the predators are and the, the porn folks are very adept at taking URLs that exist. And if you make a mistake, leading you where you don't want to go. So that was part of the discussion last time when we talked about how important it is to make sure children and youth understand what they're, what they're doing when they're on the web. But we also have bonus questions for you. And it relates as well more to tonight. When you talk to your, your tweens, your teens, or youth in your life about sex and consent, think about it. I mean, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. How comfortable are you? You may not want to put a one or four, but we'd love if you have the courage to do so. Oh, you avoid, you avoid it. A two is, well, you know, I'll give them something to read. It's like my mom used to put Grey's Anatomy in the bathroom, thinking I would read that. Uh, you're comfortable asking questions, or you've been talking to them for a long time about these topics, and you feel pretty comfortable about it. I'm getting a lot of fours here. One, three, oh. but mostly fours. Okay, well, then we're talking to the choir, so you guys are probably going to have some good questions tonight. That's terrific. And then the last bonus question was, you saw something on somebody's browser tab that made you feel uncomfortable. What do you usually do when you see that? One, you, you ignore it. Two, you crack a joke. Three, you call your best friend and you go, oh my God. Or four, you go, mm, I think we need to discuss this. What do we got? Getting some four, get a four and a one, ignore it. I think we need to discuss, there's a four. The three. And what's interesting is those aren't necessarily wrong or inappropriate. I mean, the first time you see that, like on a 12 year old, you may want to ignore it, right? So a lot of what we'll talk about tonight really is um, situation dependent and uh, judgment dependent. And so what we're trying to do is help you be more comfortable and more courageous in um, building up your ability to, to have these questions. And that's why we have on the next slide that, you know, it's, it's important to have the courage to begin conversations that matter because these are the conversations that matter. So tonight we'll um, tell you who Jcast is for those of you who haven't um, been to one of our presentations before. We'll do a quick overview of sex trafficking and pornography to bring everybody up to speed uh, based on what we saw last time. And some of you may not remember a lot of what we uh, showed you last time, and then we'll get into our topics about healthy relationships and consent. Again, feel free to put some questions for Gail in the chat or for everybody. Uh, I just really won't be able to see them until she um, brings them up. I think Debbie mentioned that JCAS started in 2013. It's uh, not been around as long as NCJW, which started here in Chicago in 1893. It's currently based in Washington, DC, because we do a lot of advocacy work, but uh, primarily education and community service. And some, some of our members decided in 2013 that there was just something about sex trafficking they wanted to deal with. Maybe it was because people in the Jewish community didn't think it existed in the Jewish community, which we know now, certainly as a result of Jeffrey Epstein and Robert Kraft and, excuse me, some other people uh, that definitely exists in the Jewish community. And people thought it didn't exist in, in our own communities. And last time we let people know that, in fact, yes, it does. So that's a little bit about uh, who we are as part of NCJW. Um, we want to do a real a quick overview of uh, human trafficking, and we call it human trafficking. Human trafficking is the umbrella for labor trafficking and sex trafficking. But as you'll see, it's uh, the 150 billion with a B dollar business. 99 of that is the sex trafficking piece, and that's why we like to call it the MBA of domestic violence, because a lot of the issues are the same. 
but it's really uh, an economic and um, uh, and very very large business. In our in our last program, we showed uh, a, like a one minute video about the different categories of businesses that human trafficking exists in, and um, I think that kind of uh, surprises people when they they see that. So, in terms of the definition. It's the recruitment and transportation of persons by force. This is a federal definition, right? It's a federal um, law by force, fraud, or coercion. The force part, uh, often violence is, unlike domestic violence, where violence often comes towards uh, the end of the domestic uh, violence cycle. In, in sex trafficking, it, it can often come at the beginning because it's the seasoning process and, and the process where it breaks the victim's resistance to being under control. The fraud piece often involves false job offers, um, responding to an advertisement where you think you're gonna get a great job and you end up not. So especially uh, immigrants and international fraud. And the coercion piece has to do with um, patterns or a plan intended to cause uh, the victim to believe that if they or the survivor, hopefully survivors, but the victim to believe that if they don't do A, B, or C, that um, some, they'll, they'll be harmed or somebody in the family will be harmed. It's important to note that we're talking about economic exploitation here. This is about power and control and economics more than it is about sex. Important thing to note though, regarding people under 18, because uh, there's no need to show these three uh, parts of human trafficking to, uh, to be caught as a, a trafficker. Basically, those three are, are necessary if you're over 18. If you're under 18, you are automatically in trouble because there, there is no such thing as child prostitutes. Anybody under 18 is automatically a victim. So uh, we also wanna like to make connections with some of our other programs. And um, uh, Gail, I, uh, you may wanna, uh, I don't know if you have it with you, but uh, Talia Karner's book, uh, uh, The Third Daughter. So NCJW, we did a, a book program, a, a book club program with her book, that's about it's a it's a novel, but it's based on the Jewish the real Jewish uh, sex trafficking ring called Zvi Migdal, and uh, w which existed between like 1870 something until 1939. And what they would do is transport women from uh, Central and Eastern Europe to Buenos Aires, and there was a you know generations of of sex trafficking victims there. So it. It goes, right? It's been going on for a long time. What we're trying to do is work to end it. I don't think we gave any uh, resources for you or a hotline last time. So I, we put that up this time that if you run into somebody or you know somebody who might need some help, you can give this them this information. The Polaris Project is a, an organization specifically intent as well on ending sex trafficking. They, they're the ones that do a, a lot of research. And I'm not gonna go into this, but basically it's to show you that of the top three identified sex trafficking types, escort services, uh, massage, health, beauty, and pornography, way, way outnumbers labor trafficking. So you hear a lot about labor trafficking, but the real issue is, um, is sex trafficking. And it's a transaction. So if we bring it down from the macro and legal level down to the local level here in Chicago, all, all those numbers that we uh, showed you last time, basically, in, you can say in one sentence, 16 to 25,000 mostly females per day, including those from the LGBTQ community because the threat for them of being outed or already having been kicked out of their house means that they're vulnerable. The isolated, the poor, immigrants, prior abuse victims are often um, in trouble as well in this area. They are trafficked, which means they're sold to men, mostly men, who purchase, more than half of them, twice a month. They've 
they've been to a lot of them been to college but the the girls the women have been lured and groomed by someone they often know and that may still be surprising to you that almost half of the the victims know the person who is trafficking them and as we talked about last time it's also a function of of having been lured and groomed we we still think that uh and we brought this up last time. We still think it's a basis for what we what we'll do tonight. But you know, where does pornography fit into this? That because our goal is to inform you about sex trafficking, we we think we really need to discuss how how it is that the men, mostly men, who are the majority of purchasers, you know, they're the profiteers, they're the perpetrators. How is it that they come to see sex? Uh, excuse me. How is it that they come to see purchasing sex as acceptable? So we threw a lot of numbers at you last time. Uh, you may not remember that 46 to 48 percent say they purchase sex to obtain sex acts that they either felt uncomfortable with asking their partner to do or that their partner refused to perform. So we'll spend more time on that in the next session, a little bit uh, mention it again later. But our belief is that if people, ha people have healthier relationships, so we come in at this from a healthy relationship place, and if people are better able to discuss their personal desires and their personal needs, that we'd have less demand for paid sex. I mean, I, I don't think we're so naive to think that that's going to actually go away, but we certainly can reduce it and we can, and we can give our community some understanding and some skills to protect the people um, whom they love. But we see part of our role also as and you may have heard it as the consent movement. It, it, that sort of it may be a little more positive than the Me Too movement, but the consent movement, uh, part of that, which is what we also think we are engaged in, is to teach men that part of loving their partners uh, or anybody is that um, is respecting the no, right, that somebody gives them. So that if, if, you, if somebody says no to their partner, what we're trying to say is that rather than saying to them, hey, if you won't give it to me, then I'm gonna go find somebody who will, that that's not the most powerful relationship. That part of what we wanna do is help men understand respecting that their partners know is really important. And that's, that's kind of the, the direction that we like to go in. But does, you know, the increase in acceptability, be, partly because it's everywhere, um, movies and on the internet, and then the increase of availability, does that mean there's an increase in demand for paid sex? We, we don't really know that. I, I, at least I haven't seen a, a lot of studies about that. The point is, there's still something you can do when you see uh, you know, that person have that tab up that you're uncomfortable with and you decide to have a conversation about what pornography means, you can say, you know, those videos that you're watching online, they're staged, they're like any other movie and they're not examples of regular sexual, sexual behavior. What, what we wanna do is help you plan for conversations that you'll need to have so that you're not as surprised when you see something and you can't think of anything to say. Really what it's about is educating and making the distinction between reality and fantasy for people of like we saw in Washington on January 6th of all ages, right? That reality and fantasy sometimes get mixed. But you don't want to blame and you don't want to shame. What we're doing is hoping that we can help you educate. So we thought that uh, we wanted to introduce the power and control wheel here, which I don't think we've introduced before in relation to sex trafficking. It's a, as we say, it's a transaction. I think you'll find this a useful tool. It's used in domestic violence work. Uh, it's used in teen dating violence, which uh, February this month is teen dating violence awareness month, which if I had orange, I was going to put on some orange tonight because that's sort of the color for teen dating violence awareness. But I realized I don't have anything orange. Um, some of the situations will be different. So for instance, uh, I, I don't know how much of this you can see, but in uh, more power uh, issues and relations when somebody denies somebody access to their children, that's 
that's a problem. A lot of teens don't have children yet, so that particular situation wouldn't apply to them. But the idea of intimidation, emotional abuse, physical abuse, economic abuse is, is all there. And in fact, um, from a domestic violence perspective, I, I'm also on the board of Between Friends, which is a domestic violence agency in Chicago. 95% of the clients, the, the, the primary issue that they have is um, economic abuse, is financial abuse. Physical abuse is not always present in, in domestic violence cases. Obviously in sex trafficking, it's going to be there. We've seen some high profile cases, right? We talked about these last time and um, yet I don't wanna be completely negative. So we, as in Illinois, you know, we're not so great at a lot of things. We've got a lot of governors in jail, for instance, or almost, were in jail, but in Illinois, we're pretty good about domestic violence and, and prostitution because if you're under 18, you're no longer um, basically uh, considered uh, prosecuted for uh, prostitution and, it, and it's not a felony. So in fact, there's more money devoted now to trying to get the, the victims off the street and help them survive. So uh, Illinois at least has some positive things that are going on. How are we doing? Any questions or anything yet, Gail? Uh, there was one question about uh, how, how, how whether partners are saying no or how, or how that whole piece about um, why men are purchasing and, and um, I think we kind of talked about that a little bit, but we're wondering if you had anything else you wanted to comment about. I, and in, in what sense that, how, how do we deal with that? So uh, what, just clarifying that that's what you were saying. Yes, I, okay, yes. What we were saying was <clears throat> that the paradigm shift that we wanna make that the consent movement tries to make is, and we'll talk about consent uh, later on tonight, is that um, in a relationship that's equal, each partner needs to respect the other partner's issues around consent. And if someone doesn't want to perform a particular act, there needs to be more of a discussion around what do we do about that rather than someone going off and just saying, well, I'm going to go buy somebody who'll do that with me. I mean, you know, there's, uh, didn't we used to call that swinging in the old days? I mean, I don't, you know, there's lots of groups now that engage in open safe sex. And so maybe you can, you know, somebody could agree with that. So there's, there's, we're not gonna get into some of these solutions. The point is it, uh, the consent movement is more about having more conversation rather than just cutting off that part of a relationship and having people sort of go their own way. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question. But um, in terms of the luring part, that can happen at any age. And uh, when I was um, doing this program, I found a PSA from the FBI. I forget why I went to the FBI site, but they often have a lot of information there as well. And last June, excuse me, there was a, they, put this uh, PSA, which is a public service announcement up for people to use for educational purposes, which is what we're doing, that his daughter was missing. And she's 13 year old. She met somebody on social media, a 25 year old, a 21 year old guy came from Louisiana to Texas to pick her up. Uh, fortunately, the border patrol intercepted them because she thought she wanted to run away to Mexico. Well, the, the point is, why was she wanting to run away to Mexico? It didn't say, we don't know. From our point of view, what we're trying to do is say, gosh, hopefully there are ways to engage with your children or your grandchildren to find out what's going on with them before they decide to go online and find a friend. And especially during the, the age now pandemic when they're so isolated and you know stuck in their rooms on their computers all day. Uh, we thought we'd show this again because it's only uh, 25 seconds or so, but uh, and reminder that Wisconsin has, has a pretty big sex trafficking problem. It's not just in large cities, it's everywhere. And um, that anybody can be lured. I befriended um, the guy's girlfriend, so I befriended his girlfriend and then we became friends and you know, it's, it's, you're young and you like to have a best friend or feel like you have a best friend and, you know, it's fun to go with someone to get your nails done and so they lure you in through materialistic items. 
So lots of ways to do that. So questions, that's kind of the real quick summary. Um, what we wanted to, I hope it was a quick, but we wanted to move into talking about healthy relationships because really it's about balance. And I mean, clearly, you know, if you're raising children or being around children, uh, it's on one side, you know, there's this balance, the youth are trying to establish themselves, but on the other hand, they need to be supported and feel safe as well and a, and a place where they can stretch like a rubber band and come back if they need it. Um, but it's really about building resilience and handling risk so that if you think about the vulnerabilities that the youth face these days, I mean, first of all, how do you define teen? Uh, a lot of years now in those uh, in that age of, of that rubber banding back and forth. The, a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. How do we know is that youth, youthful rebellion that we all went through and, and the trying to seek status, is that harmless or is it a hateful issue? And especially when they have so much access to online and, and can get out their emotion where you don't even know they're doing that. Trauma, loss, disruption. Now everybody's experiencing that during this pandemic, and their sense of security could be shaken, along with you know a sense of anger or betrayal by we don't even know. But these are important conversations to be having, and these are the vulnerabilities that most of the professionals talk about in terms of uh, what's going on with the youth. And of course, everybody at, at that age is you know one of the biggest things is looking for friendship and love. And when they're stuck in their homes, it's, it's very tough. And the predators know this. So that the risks become distracted parents or caregivers because, you know, I'm down here in the basement and they're, they're up there in their rooms doing homework or whatever. The amount of time online is huge now. There's less supervision and support, <clears throat> excuse me, by the adults in their lives because there's fewer of them. They don't have teachers and coaches and everybody around uh, of a network that they used to have. And of course, the isolation is a huge risk as well. One of the things we, we encourage is to not assume that a simplistic answer is going to work. I think what we found and what the research shows is that the predators try to offer simplistic solutions to some of these issues. And that's very appealing to young people because the predators are trying to drive a wedge between the young people and the adults that they would normally trust. And that's something that, that we're um, saying for you to watch out for. All right, so if you think about a healthy relationship, uh, here's a chance for you to stick some more words into a chat. What are the components of a healthy relationship that you're trying to teach to your children or that you want your children to teach to their children. What kind of words would you put in there if you were gonna have a conversation with them about what's important in a relationship? Getting respect, communication, caring, kindness, another good one. So while you're doing that, how many of you have heard of John Gottman? He's one of those gurus, relationship gurus, written a lot of books and done a lot of studies. He can predict with scary accuracy, based on how couples communicate, whether they're gonna divorce. And he's also done studies on raising emotionally healthy youth. So you know the I, I you may be familiar with, because uh, I think Dr. Phil would probably also talk about these things. But uh, when people are interacting, when, when Gottman sees them interacting and they're rolling their eyes at each other, that disdain is almost always present and he, he often will predict that that couple will end up in divorce, partly because of the behaviors that they exhibit when they're communicating. So one of the things you wanna think about is, yes, what values do you want to, um, to share? We don't wanna push our values onto you. The only value that we push out based on our beliefs is that uh, people, especially women, should not be sold like a sack of potatoes for sex. Other than that, when you're talking about healthy relationships, here, and you've mentioned some of these words as well, 
what what do you sh want to share with the people in your life when you talk about important relationships? And one of the analogies I like to use is a candy jar in, in a relationship. And I used to use this uh, when I did uh, leadership training, partly actually literally, I had a candy jar in my office because most supervisors and leaders would, gosh forbid, never come talk about this stuff. But what they could do is come by for a piece of candy. And then of course they would have a few minutes to talk. So the, the candy jar is, if you keep putting candy in in a relationship, then people can be taking some out and you can have a, a good interact, uh, interaction and in, in a healthy relationship. But if somebody's always withdrawing from the, from the candy jar and withdrawing uh, energy from the relationship, it's, it's going to fail. So you need to have both uh, uh, people putting in as well as, as drawing out. So what do you want? Uh, your youth to uh, to value. I think what's interesting is uh, a lot of these words are the words that the youth listed for what they want as well from their parents. They want your trust. They want your respect. They don't not necessarily the friendship part as much, but they. Um, it's important that you let them uh, make choices and. Uh, but they really don't, they don't want you as friends necessarily. <laughs> so it's important as well to, to make the distinction between accepting emotions, like strong negative emotions and making the distinction between that and negative behaviors. So that's something else that's important to do when you're working with and talking with other people. How do you, how do you help kids talk about it? Is it a, attraction or friendship. I mean, I remember, I don't remember if I told this last time, but I was babysitting uh, my niece and nephew one time in St. Louis when they were like 11 and eight or something. And we went out for ice cream and my 11 year old nephew said, and Kathy, um, how do you, how do you get to kiss a girl? And I did, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure I was ready for that. But I said, well, um, something about girls like it when you ask them if you can kiss them. And so he, he considered that because I guess there's somebody he wasn't sure was on the horizon. And his little sister says, ew, nobody's going to want to kiss you. So it can come up anytime over ice cream in any relationship. And so I, of course, was honored that that he would even ask me this kind of thing. So I learned to become much more comfortable with the fact that, oh, they might ask the aunt something that they wouldn't ask their parents. So it helps to, to be prepared, but it also ha helps to have a sense of humor. I think many of you have probably heard of Zen Judaism. Uh, the Buddha taught that one should practice loving kindness to all sentient beings. That's really cool, but still, you no, know, would it kill you to find a nice sentient being who happens to be Jewish? If that's one of the values, find a way to, to mention that value. All right, and we did get something in the email. Somebody sent us a question about, um, remind me, Gail, what the question was about, because uh, made me think of this when I saw the, the social emotional development. Right, how, how our young people are, are learning about uh, uh, healthy relationships and, and, and health. Oh in yeah, schools. right, in school. So uh, I think one of the, the good, uh, news pieces here is that schools are actually dealing with what we call social emotional development, not just intellectual development. So not just IQ, but EQ. And the intent is to help them better understand themselves, help them overcome some of these uh, emotional and relationship challenges and build strong relationships throughout life. Because studies, they've been able to do some, you know, uh, not full life longitudinal studies yet, but some studies that show that uh, youth with high EQ, they tend to handle change and strong emotions much more productively. And certainly that's, that's what we would like. So the, the more grounded the youth are in these things, the, the more confidence they'll have, the less vulnerable they'll be to others. And I think the more confident you can be that they will not be lured in by somebody else. So some of these pieces are helping them with emotional vocabulary. Um, 
you know, I joke around a lot about emojis when they first came out and my uh, uh, nieces and nephews were younger and I, they would send me some funny emoji. It's a great opportunity to next time you talk to them or when you're on the phone with them to say, you know, you sent me this emoji that looked like a, huh? what, what were you trying to tell me? So that they're really matching some of the words that they might use with some of the things that they're feeling and seeing. They, you know, they deserve uh, respect and you wanna show them how to be empathetic. You know, now we, we've got a president uh, in the White House who's very empathetic and maybe that's gonna help things. Maybe people under uh, pay more attention to what it really means. Emotions are always there, uh, help them understand in real life interactions, in the literature, in what they're doing at school, when they're watching TV or movies, and help them by modeling a rich emotional life for people and pointing these things out for youth in, uh, and adults of all orientations. So teach them to accept um, the strong emotions in others. Has anybody been putting in the chat one of the things you might, you know, do you know of anything that's going on for the youth in your lives? Where, what are they learning? Uh, and if not, why, why aren't you hearing about any of this from the schools? And is it something that you would consider asking your school about uh, including in the curriculum if you don't, if they haven't sent anything so home saying we're gonna be talking about this? Nothing, Gail? Nope. Okay. But think about that. Uh, it's really important if you've got youngsters uh, in school to know what they're learning about. And then, of course, if you think the goals, what are the goals you have in mind when you want to talk to adults or youth about this? If you think about what words you would like them to use to describe you, put some of those in the chat. So for instance, I, I would hope that my nieces and nephews would have something other than I'm cool because I have an Instagram account. But I think they, they can, I can call me and whenever one of them does, I'm like, you know, I'm in heaven thinking, wow, they called me to talk about stuff. So uh, for me, it, a word I would use is I want them to see me as accessible and approachable. How would you like to be described by the important people in your life? And if you could think about it from that perspective, how then do you wanna communicate with them in a way that they actually would describe you that way. So we're getting a honest, understanding, empathetic, empathetic and supportive. The cool. Good words. Cool. And you know, it sounds silly and dorky, um, but it's okay to start a conversation and plan for it before you start it. So in our longer programs uh, that we've done, like with some other synagogues, we teach people how to have these conversations when we give them a planning sheet and we give them some steps for the conversation and they practice with each other in, in role plays. So the question is, what are you aiming for? If you can be more strategic about these conversations, I think you'll be less surprised when, when things come up. Do you wanna just acknowledge that they're curious about dating and sex? Or do you wanna really sit down and say, okay, you know, you're about to get your driver's license. Here's what we expect in terms of um, safety and security. Whatever it is, it's really important that you sit down and think about it. If you want more age appropriate material, commonsense.org is a great place to go. I don't know if you know it, it was, <clears throat> excuse me, started by Jim Steyer, who's the brother of um, their billionaires, right? Of, of Tom Steyer, who ran for president. Uh, actually, their, their father was Jewish, by the way. Uh, Planned Parenthood, of course, is a great place. And loveisrespect.org is, uh, I, guess, I don't know if you want to call it a chapter, or it's a part of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So loveisrespect.org has uh, really great age-appropriate information in it if you want to go there. Which leads to the question of what is an effective question, uh, effective conversation anyway? So here's some tips for you. Um, you may not always agree, but one of the ones I think is, is important is pick the timing that works for them, not you. If they come home, you know, having messed up an exam, it's not probably a good time to talk about something like this. So uh, if you have to set up a time, 
do it. Of course, they may not want to talk about it. But one of the things that's important is it's not a lecture. You want to ask questions before you tell them anything. It's important to reassure them, empower them, but also let them know that you're not always going to agree. Okay. Questions about, about that speedy run through some healthy relationship issues. Because I think the consent piece is, um, is really in probably more what you're, you're thinking about because it's a huge issue. Uh, we know it's important, but we don't talk about it enough. Uh, we don't talk about what it is. We don't talk about what it isn't. And it's really about many different types of boundaries, uh, physical, emotional, a, a time boundary, uh, the respect for time, right? Intellectual, sexual, material things, you know, whether or not somebody goes into your stuff. Uh, so establishing consent and boundaries is, is really about boundaries. When we talk about it in terms of relationships and sex, uh, let me, I can't really see hands, but how many of you uh, would want to have this kind of discussion the way that you did when you were in seventh grade gym, you know, sex ed or gym class? You, you probably wouldn't. You, you would do this in a completely different way, in a completely different way. And so that's what we're recommending, <laughs> that, that we, we be more planful about it and not be as embarrassed about it as when we were were young. And in fact, Illinois, somebody did raise this question, right, Gail? Illinois, um, I think it was last January, so January of 2020, uh, the law was uh, implemented that sex ed basically had to be, uh, when it was uh, grade six through 12, that sex ed had to include the, de uh, the definition of consent. And they had like eight different factors that included consent. And you can look that up. Um, we might be able to give you a URL directly to the law if, if you wanted it. But uh, we've finally gone into the modern world in Illinois education, and we are um, required to in include consent in if, if we're doing health and sex education. So my, my niece at um, Indiana, when she was a freshman last year, I said, hey, Katie, you know, I'm doing this thing and we're starting to talk about consent. How are you guys being taught about this now? Well, it turns out that before she could even get to school, she had to take an online class. Then they had some sessions when she got there, one of which was a musical. I think NYU or some other colleges have this musical that they use so that uh, the, the freshmen can sing their song about consent and it gets stuck in their head. But this picture you see here was stuck on the back of all the bathroom doors. So this is one of the ways that they share about what consent is at Indiana. And there's kind of no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you don't have consent or you're not sure, it tells you to stop because sex without consent is assault. And that's the basic bottom line that they're teaching the youth these days. So if you wanna know what they're learning, that's what they're learning. And then we talked about loveisrespect.org. If it's not a yes, if it's a maybe, or it's a I don't know, or whatever, if it's not a yes, they're being taught it's not consent. It gets kind of fudgy, of course, there's gray areas, but I think they're finding it much easier uh, now that they have at least some definition. But there's also a great way that they're learning how to think about this definition, and it's called the T-consent. And we're going to try our techie here and give you uh, 20 or 30 seconds of T consent, even from the age of eight. Here's one way youth are being taught about uh, consent. And you can look at this by yourself online. So let's get this up. Here it comes, here it comes. I'm not seeing the link. I think you had a change You're still to start. struggling with consent. Can Just you're not seeing it. Initiative. You're not seeing it. Okay, let me get back here. Off to do a new screen share. One of the dilemmas, right? You see it now? Yep. Okay, there we go. Thanks. You're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? 
and they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, hey, here we go. All right, so that's a little about uh, the tea consent that they, um, that they've used it goes on for like two and a half or three minutes altogether feel free to find it on youtube it's called tea consent and it'll pop up right away so you'll know they're being taught this uh use this video pretty pretty much and i i would imagine there might be some uh versions of it in in different languages but an important part is not just about consent but what are the warning signs of uh, unhealthy relationships. And we talked about the power wheel. You can see it again here. This is the teen power wheel because abusive relationships are about power and control. They're not about love. So you want to teach the people in your life that, and adults as well, that if they're being taken advantage of, whether it's financially or any other way, uh, to, that they need to either bring it up with their partner or bring it up with you and um, that their part, especially when they're young and they're just early on in a relationship, you bring up the issue about finances, that tells you a lot about the other person. And that can give you a way to understand, okay, this person might be trying to control me a little too much. Um, so you, you wanna be teaching them about how to look and listen for the relationships that they're in. The using male privilege piece, uh, sometimes people ask about that. That's the part where, uh, well, I'm the guy, so I'm going to define all the rules and you're going to do this and, and that's that. Um, and so that's not a very equal relationship. Questions about, about this slide, because what we're going to do now is give you a chance to, to apply some of this. Uh, in one of the, the teen dating program at Between Friends, they, they have a spectrum that's when they're working with adults as well, uh, but primarily the youth in the schools. And uh, it's the healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe spectrum. So they give them a behavior and they say, hmm, is this unhealthy? Is it unsafe? Or is it healthy? And sometimes there's some discussion. So let's see, uh, get your cursor ready in your chat and let's go through a few of these and see what you think. So your child argued with you about curfew. Is that healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe? What do you think? They're getting mostly healthy. There was one unhealthy. Okay. It's unsafe. So the answer is there's not always going to be an answer, right? In this case, a lot of you might be thinking it's healthy because, oh, that means they're learning to stand up to me or they're they're questioning, and that's a good sign. On the other hand, it might be, whoa, why are they always questioning me? What's going on here? So my friend was mad that I went to the mall with somebody else and he yelled at me. Healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe? You got one healthy, you got an unhealthy, you got another unhealthy, got a number of unhealthy ones coming in. So another gray area, okay. Well, this time my friend invited me to spend the weekend at their parents' cabin with other classmates. Healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe, regardless of a pandemic. Getting a lot of unhealthies and unsafe here. And unsafe. <laughs> Gee, you guys are tough. Uh, I remember when I was a senior in high school, I thought it was the coolest thing when my parents let me go spend uh, one night of a weekend with a whole bunch of us going down to somebody's cabin. I was like, wow, I was trusted. Now, I was probably the only person who didn't get 
sick drunk, but you know, what can I say? Uh, I was impressed that my parents trusted me enough to let me go do that. My partner said, well, we don't need to use condoms because they don't feel right. And these are actual examples that we use with the teens. We're getting a lot of unsafe ones here. Yeah, and that's, that's obvious as well as it's a great uh, way to have these discussions with the youth to start these discussions. And when I was at my friend's house, they showed me where their parents' gun is hidden. A lot of unsafe again. Right. Finally, my friend asked me, oh no, one more. My friend asked me if I was in the mood for sex, healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe. Getting a healthy, getting getting an unsafe, a little bit of both here. Okay, well, so part of the question is what makes you go to one side or the other? I think when we're working with the teenagers, we would say that that's a good sign that they're asking each other about this. And finally, my friend asked me to send a picture of me with my pants down. If anybody says that's healthy, we got a discussion offline. <laughs> yep, lots of unsafe ones. Yeah. So that's, that's one of those first grooming steps, right? That when the children start doing that, um, they're, they're starting down that path of being groomed, as well as the fact that, you know, kids do this. The hardest thing is to impress upon them that once they've hit send, it could be in the ethernet forever. So that, that's, that's part of a, the problem there. Questions about or comments about healthy, unhealthy, or unsafe. You, you know, it's not proprietary. If you want to use this and talk about it any way you want, it's a great, it's a very simple tool that you can use to um, uh, engage in discussion. When I, when I do tabling events uh, as a volunteer and the parents come up with their kids, they don't all always agree on these things. So it's great. So that, that was a quick whirlwind. Uh, in less than an hour about uh, sex trafficking as a review, but we also talked about uh, having powerful conversations about healthy relationships and consent. Um, but you may not think your children are susceptible. And you know, the last time we talked, we shared the story of Maggie from Highland Park, who was uh, a teen cutout on the right of the picture that you see. But here's another one because the stories are really important. So I'm gonna to have to read this because I have, don't have it memorized, but um, the traffic teen on the left is Leah and she's 15 uh, when this was done and she's from Deerfield. She was a high school sophomore. She, you know, her friends were dating a lot. She was, you know, dating a little bit but she never found men very interesting. She started studying with Stacy from her math class and one day Stacy kissed her. She wasn't sure what to make of it but she liked how kind Stacy was. So they kept studying together and the bond grew. Leah's mom found out and threw her out of the house. Leah was in the park one day up in Deerfield, figuring out what to do when she met Missy. And Missy offered her a place to sleep after hearing her story. The next morning, Leah woke up to find the room was locked and it was locked for days with nothing for her to eat. And when the room was finally unlocked, men entered and Leah was forced to have sex with them. And now she's caught in sex trafficking. So these are two stories um, and it can happen. And it's something that we really are trying to reduce from lots of perspectives tonight. Of course, we wanted to talk more about how do you have conversations to make sure that your youth are protected and, and that they're connected and rooted to what, what you have as values. So by the end of the session in March, what we want to do is increase your comfort level with conversations with children and youth about sex and relations and have them see you as a supportive resource. And our goal is if we can do some of these things, we think we can reduce the number of people who purchase sex. And if that can be done, then we can reduce the number of people who are exploited for sex. So that, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Questions, thoughts? that you haven't already asked. I think uh, it's, it's a lot in an hour, 
maybe one word for what you're thinking, if you put it in the chat, what you're thinking now about, about all this topic, or what did you learn, if anything, this evening? What, what's something that you learned and will take with you as you go? So there's that. And then we'll see you on March 11th. I think Gail, you or, or Debbie or somebody also wanted to mention something about some May programming that we have as well as if you like this programming y'all, uh, we really would appreciate your support as a volunteer or as a donor. Um, I'm, I'm a volunteer, so I don't get paid, but I couldn't do this without Gail who, who does make a few pennies helping us out doing this. So if you're willing, uh, we would really appreciate a donation at uh, ncjwcns.org. Thanks. What else, Gail, you got for us on um, or do you, I, I, I have, um, I have to look at it on my, uh, my screen because I have it. Can you let me share my screen for a quick sec? Melissa? Yeah, I, I unshared. Yeah, anyone can share. Anyone can share. That's so nice. Okay, let me see if I can figure out where I'm at, though. I had a little something on both what's coming up for NCJW as well as uh, the May 6th event. Let me see if I can get that. Okay, so NCJW has a number of things coming up in February. We have a Repro Shabbat tomorrow night with BJBE and our Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg. She's the resident um, scholar in residence for NCJW. It's a Facebook Live type thing. So um, we also have another salon coming up on February 17th, which is alternative, alternative family building, ethical, moral, and legal issues in fertility and reproductive technology with our very own Nora Zuckerman, who runs the Luggage for Freedom program. And we also have another program on the 22nd, which is NCJW Spotlight. And it's about indigenous people and all of our pictures are over in my writing. So I don't know what it says. Okay, <laughs> indigenous people falling through the cracks, issues uh, facing native American communities. And those are all virtual. You can find everything you need to know at ncjwcns.org. Two more quick things. and. Um, we also do community service and we sometimes it falls through the cracks. This month we're doing uh, Shabbat gift bags for seniors. You can also find this information on our um, website. We're asking people to put together a little gift bag of items and to write a note. If you're interested in doing that, you can actually um, send an email to community service at ncjwcns.org. Um, or look at our website. And now, two special events that um, sort of save the dates. And the one that um, Gail was and Kathy were discussing is May 6th. Um, Mary, I took this from your website, so I hope it's all correct. <laughs> and um, NCJW CNS and her story theater present Men in the Making, Domestic Sex Trafficking and the Male Buyer. And I'm not quite sure how to say the performer's name. Is it Jamise? Um, Mary, you can unmute yourself if you want yes, to Yes, it's Jamise it. Wright. Okay. Um, I, so it's Jamise Wright performs a monologue from the play Monger. And then uh, we're gonna followed by a panel discussion. So that's on May 6th. But before that, on March 7th through 9th, we're doing a screening of shared legacies. Uh, the African-American Jewish Civil Rights Alliance. It's an excellent documentary. You get a chance to watch it over a period of days, and then we're going to have a panel discussion on that. Other than that, nothing's going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for giving me the time to do that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? I have one question that you can't probably answer in two seconds. How much when they're teens and even older, does alcohol just sort of mess this value teaching all up? Because I know on campus, we, we have, my, my son's out of college, but while he was in college, 
so many of the assaults happened when both parties were inebriated. Yep. And that, that is a great, great question because uh, it's an issue as well in domestic violence, right? And the, the answer, <laughs> the answer right, yeah. is that uh, substance abuse is never an excuse. Mm -hmm. Right. So if if you're assaulting somebody, if you're beating somebody up, uh, if you're yelling at someone, you're coming home from work exhausted and you're, you know, you get drunk and you beat somebody. Uh, substance abuse is never an excuse. And so when you hear the, when a lot of the abusers end up going to like anger management school or whatever, when they try to um, uh, get their own sort of therapeutic, I guess, uh, help. Uh, the first thing that they're taught, and not that they ever agree, but uh, substance abuse is never an excuse. So that I'm hoping that's what they're taught uh, at college. Yeah. But it does reduce your inhibitions, and uh, the problem is, um, it's not it's not an excuse. And that would I mean, need my, to be taught. You know, one of the first things my mother did, taught me before I went off to college, because when I went off to college uh, in New York State, drinking age was 18. In Missouri, it was still, in Missouri, it was still 21. She taught me, <laughs> you know, rest her soul, right? She, she taught me how to put drinks in plants. <laughs> how to pour, you know, how to pour, how to get rid of your drinks so that you don't have to drink as, I mean, I, I you know, my husband always teased me, I'm a cheap, cheap date because I, I have a low alcohol tolerance. And so <laughs> I have to always figure out how do you get rid of the drink when I was in college or when I was out? Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it, you teach what you need to teach. Yeah, it's a difficult part. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I don't know if that helped. Other questions? It does. I mean, I enjoy the entire presentation. Oh, thank, thank you so much. So if there's no other question, uh, Mary, you had a question? I oh, think we're all, okay. yeah. we're all saying goodbye. It's because it's after eight o'clock. It's been great seeing you and we'll see you in March. Bye-bye.